Would you stand with me as we honor God and his word and turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 as well, you may want to put your finger in 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, as we stand and honor God's word together, I'm going to be reading from verse 24. As you're turning there, um, let me say I am not Pastor Jeff, so if you don't like the message, try again next week. Uh, I am, uh, uh, we call each other brothers, uh, we are brothers in Christ, but we do believe uh, somewhere along the line we have blood. Uh, but like I said, um, don't let his younger brother, much younger brother, uh, embarrass him tonight. Give him a try next week if you're here for the first time. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Sorry, I have to do this. So Rob said, oh, you hope I didn't preach the same message twice? I almost went there and, and said, open your Bible to 2 Samuel chapter 24, just to kind of like mess with you guys a little. Because <laughs> um, I had a friend of mine who taught the same message four times in a row. And the elders came to him and said, you know, I just don't think you know, can pastor this church. And he said, why? And he goes, you've taught the same message four times in a row. And the message was on uh, loving others. So he responded and said, when you get the first message, I'll go to the second. <laughs> Turn your Bible to 2 Samuel 24. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> first Samuel. I love you guys. Sorry, we just played together, right? First Samuel chapter 9. Oh. <laughs> now you got me all confused. People are yelling at me. I don't know what's going on. Because I got all Pentecostal with Jeff. It's not Calvary Chapel. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. You make one mistake up here and you guys just yell at me. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? But one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Lord, I pray that you would bless the reading of your word. I pray that um, the word itself, your word, the breath of your mouth, would hit us like a hurricane, a cat five, and wreck our lives for the sake of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. And have your seat. I ask you to turn your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 6. If you'd go ahead and go there, I'm going to read verse 11. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, Love, patience, and gentleness. If you remember last week, we were talking about the bad decision of David. He chose to take a census. He chose to go uh, and make a decision without consulting God. And we saw the, the fruit and the benefit. We saw those that made a decision to rebel against David, whether it was the rebellion of Beech Tree or whether it was the rebellion of Absalom. These 70,000 men thought they had quite possibly gotten away with it. But when this plague came upon the nation of Israel, we discovered they did not get away from it because you can't hide from your sin. Be sure your sin will find you out. And so David learned a very powerful lesson about the importance of making wise decisions. And now here tonight we talk about the kinds of decisions that we need to make. This 
uh, particular verse, if you read it in the message version, now I know the message is not exactly everything that we want it to be in that sense, so don't call me a heretic for quoting it. However, I love the way that he puts this particular text, and he says this, but you, Timothy, man of God, run for your life from all of this. Run for your life. I've done this a couple of times. You guys know that uh, I was a missionary in Liberia, West Africa for many years, and I'll never forget in the context of living in their civil war, uh, a good friend of mine, he's about 58, 60 years old, um, he actually had gotten shot in the middle of the war, nine bullets taken to his leg. And so his leg, one side was a little bit shorter than the other, and he kind of walked with a limp. And we would go from town to town and village to village, and we would share the gospel. Um, and we would go into places where these rebel soldiers were, and we would minister the gospel to them. Most of you know my story. We adopted two child soldiers um, out of, thankfully, the 1,500 that God gave us the opportunity to rescue from this crisis. And so um, in this understanding, we would go into these villages, and you know, I called him Hopalong Cassidy. He would kind of come along, and, and I did. We just had this wonderful, great relationship, me and Mr. Williams. And I'll never forget, we're walking down this path. Now, let me paint the picture for you. It's not like a path like a sidewalk, cement, and cars going by. This is like the dark continent, okay? Liberia is, has never been developed by a European uh, a country, never was a colony. So it just kind of developed on its own. And so most of the roads are still dirt, and most of the paths are just these little teeny dirt roads that have a canopy of green around you. You don't walk through it unless you got a machete because you don't know what's going to come out and eat you. And so we are walking down this road, and then all of a sudden, these two women come running the opposite direction, screaming, rebels on the road, rebels on the road. Well, did you think I was going to go towards that village? Absolutely not. They scream rebels on the road. They're running the opposite direction. I started running the opposite direction as well. I kept running and I kept running and I kept running until I got to the main road. And it was at the main road that I realized I had left my 58-year-old friend <laughs> coming as fast as he can to get away from the rebels that were running after him. I got issues, man. <laughs> but there's nothing like running for your life. You lose all semblance of anything, and the only thing that you're thinking is self-preservation. I'll never forget, I was ministering in Brazil, and we were in the... Um, Barrios of Brazil, and uh, while we were there, we were talking to this gang, and uh, one of the gang members, he was as drunk as you can possibly imagine, but my assistant's brother got saved while he was drunk, and so I figured, let me keep going. And so I kept going, and as we were talking, he began to sober. He accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior and Lord, and I'm telling you, as soon as his eyes opened in prayer, he was totally sober. Well, the very next thing that he says to me is, my friends are going to stab me, and that was amazing. I got to tell you a story. Sorry. So I can't believe he came to Christ, okay, because my Portuguese is not so good, right? So I am speaking in Portuguese to him. His name was Hugo, okay, and instead of calling him Hugo, I called him Huevo, which means eggs, okay? <laughs> So now I'm calling this guy eggs. And then instead of saying Jesus died for your sins, in Portuguese I said, Jesus killed your fish. <laughs> he comes to Jesus, him and his fish, okay? So <laughs> Jesus can use anybody, okay? Trust me, he used me. So he comes to Jesus, he says to me, my friends are gonna stab me for coming to Jesus. Well. Only about two minutes later, this guy comes to, right, another gang, gang member, he is drunk as anything. He comes, he pulls like a six inch blade out of his pocket and stabs the guy right in front of me. 
Like, I mean, from here to here, he just goes, and he stabs him right here. Well, the guy takes off, and I can't move. You know, fight or flight, I am like stuck. I, I can't do anything. I'm like watching this video of this guy running for his life. Well, the guy gets away. I haven't moved yet. So the guy with the knife comes up to me, and he's screaming at me in Portuguese. And all I hear the Lord say is, fear not, I am with you. <laughs> I say, I can't see you. <laughs> no, literally, I said it out loud. So this guy goes to, like, he's like, blah, 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 and he's like yelling at me. And all I hear is, fear not, for I am with you. <laughs> and honestly, I'm thinking to myself, I've gone crazy. I've got a guy with a knife pointed at me. I hear this voice saying, fear not, for I am with you. And then all of a sudden, the guy lunges as if to stab me. And all I hear is, fear not, I'm with you. I'm like, you could show up anytime now. <laughs> well, this guy, he goes to lunge at me. There was another guy that was standing. And all the guy that was standing next to me, he just kind of took a step. Well, I don't know what happened, but the guy that was, had the knife, he just ran and took off. And I just kept going, you are with me, <laughs> you know. But I'm watching this guy run for his life because he didn't want to die. Let me tell you something. When you know your life depends on something, you give it everything you've got to preserve the breath that's in you. And in this text here, Paul is asking Timothy to make a good decision. And he's asking Timothy, and he's exhorting Timothy, stay away. Don't practice evil things. Give it everything you've got. Run away from it. Now, the context in Greek is to keep running. Because in other words, these evil things will be a constant temptation throughout the course of our lives. Now, I love what Paul says, but you, O man, o man of God, flee these things. Well, what things are he speaking of? Would you look up at verse 10? For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. All kinds of evil, he says. And I like the fact that Paul doesn't define the kind of evil there in that particular text because all of us have our own little evil thing. Did you hear that? Mine is chocolate. <laughs> no, it's satanic. It actually speaks to me. I can see a chocolate cake and it says, eat me. No, it looks at me and it says, I want you to eat me. And then I lie to myself. You know, we do this all the time, right? We don't ever take a full piece. We just take a spoonful. And then we take another spoonful. And by the end of the day, you've eaten the whole cake, but you don't feel like you've eaten the whole cake. <laughs> Tell you, it's satanic. I don't know what your evil is. I'm not too sure what your chocolate is. But I like the fact that Paul doesn't define it. You see, in Galatians chapter 5, he talks about the works of the flesh. Maybe yours is slander or gossip. Maybe it's an outburst of wrath. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul speaks about what we've been redeemed from. And he, he talks about the, the, this drunkard state. He speaks about sexual immorality, even homosexuality. And he says, these are the very things that you have been redeemed from. You're no longer to be like this. Now listen, I don't know what your evil thing is, but I love that Paul doesn't define it because only you and God can. Because usually we don't display our evil things in front of everybody at church. Just imagine if one by one I asked you to come to the pulpit and do your little evil thing right in front of all of us. You're laughing because now you're embarrassed. <gasps> I can never speak to my wife like that in front of everybody. <laughs> then why do we do it in the secrecy of our homes? You see, you and God know your evil thing. It's not hidden from him. The truth is we live in a fallen world. We have an enemy. Our flesh even longs to do these evil things because Jesus in John chapter 3, he says this, men love darkness. Now, with this in mind, 
we've got to realize that we've got to be the strong athlete that Paul tells Timothy to be in 2 Timothy. We've got to be a strong athlete like Paul exhorts Timothy. We can't be a weak athlete. No, if we're going to run a race, we've got to make sure that we are ready to run. But I have a question. Who likes to run? Seriously, who likes to run? Um, uh, so here's the deal, right? Have you ever started running and you take about five steps and you think, I've gone two miles? And you finish the first block, and what you would like to do is throw up your lung, let it breathe a little bit, and then bring it back in. It's like you're gasping for breath because you've started this running process, and you're just wishing why, or wondering, why in the world have I done this? Well, every Sunday morning, I go for a run. I, I need to get out energy before I get behind the pulpit. And so I go for a run every Sunday morning, and uh, a couple of weeks ago, I went with my son. Now, my son is an African, okay? You guys know I have nine children. Uh, four of them are adopted, and five of them are biological. We have every tribe, tongue, and nation. Now that they're marrying people, we have every tribe, tongue, and nation. All we need is a Samoan. So if you are <laughs> available, I have a child for you. You should see our picture. We look like the Church of Revelation. And so... I went running with my son, okay? I want to remind you, he's an African, okay? Let me tell you something. We started running. He stayed behind me, okay? And I go, let's go, son. And I'm going, what's wrong with you? You know, I'm just kind of running, kind of running. I'm feeling good about myself. You know, <laughs> look, I'm beating the African. You know, it's kind of like, <laughs> I'm going, I'm going. We get about two miles into it, okay? And now we're going to turn around and come back. I didn't know that my son had plugged in the power pistons. When we were running back, he decided to pull it into full gear. I'm dying trying to keep up with him. I didn't want to embarrass myself and throw up on the side of the road. I'm not going to let this child beat me. So I am running as fast as I possibly can. So what does he do? He runs faster. Now, I need to let you know something. I've already gassed myself the first two miles. He did this to me on purpose. So when we got to the end of the four miles, he looks at me like I'm a pitiful 47-year-old man, and he goes, you okay? <laughs> I told him I will never run with you again. <laughs> but the truth is, I hate to run. Running takes energy, it takes time, and it takes effort. But I loved going to the doctor uh, just three weeks ago for my physical, and he said this, you're healthy. I loved that. You know, they took my heart rate and it's 40. My heart rate is 40. And he goes, you're either dead. My resting heart rate is 40. He goes, you're either dead or you're very, very healthy. I go, could you say that again? I'm what? I'm, you're very, very healthy because I like to be in shape. Well, the only way that you're going to be in shape is if you train. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. You don't enter a race and go, I quit. You don't enter a race and the gun goes off and you go, now what? <laughs> you don't enter, he goes, no, if you're going to run a race, run to win. Because there's a goal in running and the goal is to get the prize, but the prize that we're competing for, oh, it's not a gold medal. No, there's a different kind of prize. Listen, let me explain something. The reason why I went to the doctor is that my family's history, we all die be around 60 years old of this thing called AAA, an abdominal aortic aneurysm. All of a sudden, your aorta explodes and you're gone. And unless you're lying on an operation table, you don't make it. Well, guess what? I'd like to live a little bit longer. And so I went to the doctor so that I could get checked. And when he said to me, you're healthy, let me tell you something. I hit the pavement the next day. And though I don't like it, in fact, I hate it. And though it takes time and energy and effort, I'm literally running for my life. You see, when you train... You'll run a block, and even though you hate it, the next day you'll run two. The following day you'll run three. 
The following day you'll run four. The next day you'll run five. And before you know it, day after day, practice after practice, you will be a marathon runner. Now here's the deal. Paul is trying to bring this truth into our own spirituality. That when we spiritually train, we'll become the person that God desires us to be. So there's four things I want you to write down. Four things that we need to become that we're going to walk through in this scripture. First is the person of contrast, the person of God, the person of action, and the person of pursuit. One more time, the person of contrast, the person of God, the person of action, and the person of pursuit. Let's talk about the first one, the person of contrast. Would you look back, first, second, excuse me, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, but you, but you. Paul is making a clear contrast from the people that he was speaking about in the earlier text. Listen again, it's verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Many sorrows. You see, those that have gotten involved with all kinds of evil have actually made a wrong decision and have have strayed from the faith. Now, I want to apologize before I say this next statement. If you are a golfer or a baseball player, because they're the only exception to this rule, but if you are a sports person, an athlete, and you are training, you will begin to look physically different. Golfers and baseball players excluded. <laughs> Blows my mind. You could be a baseball player, and you could be 600 pounds, and you can hit that ball, and you will see this guy doom, 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 just run into first base. Blows my mind. You could be as out of shape as possible, and then all of a sudden, just because you can hit this home run, golfers, Golfers can be out of shape as well. They're the only exception to this rule. Now, if you're that person, I'm sorry if you're a golfer. I'm sorry if you're a baseball player. I asked for your forgiveness before I even started. But usually if someone is training, and usually if someone is in the middle of trying to work out, you can look at them and you can realize something is different about them. You may even walk up to them and go, now, how'd you lose all this weight? You, you might even go up to them and go, now what program are you using? You, you might even go, now what diet are you using? You might even say, what pill are you taking? Because all of us want the diet pill, don't we? We want the buff pill that when we take it at night, we wake up in the morning and <laughs> it's like we, something happened at night. I'm going to the Amazon because I'm sure it's there. <laughs> but the truth is, when you're in a physical training program, you begin to look different. It's the same with our spirituality. Because there's a difference about the person that is spiritual. Jesus, he, he describes it. There's a spirit about the disciple of, of Jesus. It's so different that people will notice. In fact, Paul said this, let your progress, Timothy, be evident to everybody. In other words, I want to see that people see a difference in you. People should see something different about you because we are different. Let me tell you something. When you went out to the Judean hills looking for John the Baptist, you didn't go out to the Judean hills and go, now where is John? No, you got this little camel wearing Tarzan suit with a, a beard down to here, and you got honey dripping, locust legs everywhere, and you're like, there is John. He looked different. He acted different, and how I longed to start a sermon the way that he did. You brood of vipers. <laughs> you guys would never invite me back. He was different, man. He was so different. You never wondered who he was. You knew exactly that's the Christian in the room. And I wonder if I was to go to your workplace, would they go, there's the Christian? I wonder if I was to go to your play place, there's the Christian. 
I wonder if I was to go to your school, there's the Christian. Could they point you out or would no one know who you were? Well, listen, if they can't, don't worry about it. You couldn't point that, them out in the disciples either. If you remember, it's Luke chapter 9, and uh, Jesus is walking through a Samaritan village. And as they're going through, they're tired. They want to get a hotel. But the Samaritan says, uh, we don't do Jews. <laughs> you can just leave. We don't do Jews here. Remember the Samaritans and the Jews, it just, doesn't, it just wasn't working between the two of them. I'll never forget when I was in Ukraine and the Russians had just invaded Crimea. I went into a hotel room, I went into a hotel, and there was a sign, we do not serve Russians. We don't serve Russians, right there in the Ukraine. And so there was this kind of animosity between the two. And so the Samaritans said, we don't allow Jews to stay in our hotels. John came up with a great idea. He went up to Jesus and he goes, Jesus, I got a great idea. Let's bring down fire from heaven and burn them all. <laughs> Every blessed Samaritan, I'm telling you, burn them, send them straight to hell. <laughs> Sorry for the country accent, but when you say that, you have to do it. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> Jesus, I can just imagine Jesus like doing this, like, Oy vey, you know, it's like, it's like he looked at them and he goes, you perverse and wicked generation. He looked at his disciples and he goes, you're a bunch of perverts. That's what he, look, he said to him. And he looks at John and he goes, John, dude, you don't know what spirit you're of. But there's hope for John. Because John was known as the son of thunder. And that wasn't a great name. That was like he was an angry individual. But John became, in the history of the church, the apostle of love. He got the message. So much so, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 13, listen to what he says. He has given us of his spirit. I get it. I know the spirit I'm of. I'm the spirit of love. Jesus says, you can't see the wind, but you can surely see the impact of it on a tree. John chapter 3. And when the Spirit of God is flowing through the people of God, love and joy and peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control are going to flow out of the believer. And I've said this to you before, I say it again, love is actually loving. Joy is actually joyful. Peace is actually peaceful. And so, I wonder with an evaluation, do we see this fruit coming out of us? There's something noticeably different about the person who's walking in the Spirit. My sister and I, Zach, we, um, uh, he's, uh, and, and most of you know Zach, he was here with me when we were here, and now he's my, uh, executive pastor over at um, Coast Hills Church and just rocking it over there. But we did a triathlon about four months ago. And we went, we went out and we were uh, looking at the course the day before and we were talking to two guys. And you know, the course of conversation, Americans, you know, hello, who are you, what do you do? And out came pastor about maybe 20 minutes into our conversation. Well, the guy that was with, there were two guys that we were talking to that were gonna do the race the next day. Well, the guy that we were talking to, he goes, oh, I'm a Christian too. And his friend said, you are? <laughs> wow. But I want to read something to you about Timothy. You can write it down in your notes of Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, listen to the testimony of Tim Timothy. But I trust in the Lord Jesus, Philippians 2.19, to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus, but you know his proven character. That as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. You know his proven character. Now, so much so, Timothy also developed a name. Take a look, it's the next point. But you, 1 Tim, Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, but you listen to the name that Timothy got. 
O man of God. You see, the first point is that we need to be a person of contrast. But you, we need to be different. We need to be someone that shines our light in the midst of a dark world. And so our first point is that we need to be a person of contrast. We need to be different, shining as lights in the world. However, in order to be a person of contrast, you need to become a person of God. There's our second point. Now, for Timothy to be called this, he's in really good company because there's few people in the Bible that were given this title. Moses, Samuel, Elijah, and David. And this title proclaims that Timothy belonged to God and was representing him well. It's as if Paul is saying, Timothy, you are a good representative of God. Well, Daniel was the same way. If you remember the story of Daniel ripped out of his holy home of Jerusalem and brought into the godless city of Babylon, he had a choice to make. Am I going to be a person of God or not? He knew the scriptures. There was no longer the peace of Jerusalem. No, there's the turmoil of Babylon. And can I tell you, here in the United States of America, we are not raising our children in Jerusalem any longer. We are raising them in Babylon. I'll never forget when I first came here to this church. The billboard above the church was overwhelming. We are raising our children in Babylon. And we've got some decisions to make, just like Daniel. And he was given all the feasts and all the food and the wine of the king. But uh, Daniel purposed to distinguish himself. He purposed to stand for God. He purposed to be obedient. He purposed to be a person of God. You see, he knew the word, and he was going to sacrifice himself to live it even in a godless generation. Well, in order to represent someone, you need to know something about them. And so to become a person of God, would you turn with me, keep your finger, 1 Timothy, go over a page, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, would you look with me at verse 16? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, here's the truth of Scripture. You have the hope to become a man of God and a woman of God. You have the hope to become thoroughly equipped and become complete because of the inspired Word of God. Um, Some of you know, some of you don't. Uh, When I was younger, I actually trained for the Olympics. I am not an American. I became an American. I'm from the Bahamas. And so I trained for the Bahamian Olympic team, and I was a swimmer. And so I trained all of the time. Well, I'll never forget one particular event. Now, I I was that kind of person um, you can only imagine, right? I would get behind the blocks, and I would start jumping like this, and I'd be doing this, and I would look at the people next to me, and I'd go, and and then I would look at the person next to me over here, and I'd start barking, you know, like this. So the people hated me, okay? All of my opponents hated me. So um, here's the deal. I get up on the block one particular time. It's finals. I'm seated first in the middle lane, and there I am in the block. Swimmer, take your mark. Well, the two people on either side of me made a decision. They decided when the guy said, swimmer, take your mark, both of them were going to go like this. Well, when they went like this, I dove into the water, and I was disqualified. I was out, done, finished. Olympic dreams were becoming very, very far away. You know what my coach did? For the next three weeks, I practiced starts four hours a day. Get out, do it again. Get out, do it again. I don't want to get out, do it again. Get out, do it again. Get out, do it again. Then what he did was he grabbed my big toes and I put my hands on the palms of the pool deck, and he held only my big toes and made me walk around the pool deck hundreds of times on my hands. 
Then he gave me a stopwatch, and I couldn't leave practice until I went, <laughs> and it was .02. I'm like, I'm not going to play Jeopardy, okay? I'm a swimmer. He goes, do it again. Do it again. And let me tell you something. In my swimming career, I never false started again. You know why? Because I trained. And that's exactly what the Word of God is saying. I'm going to invite uh, Pastor Zach Patterson up. Would you please welcome him to the stage? Because I want to dissect this for you, if I can, for just a moment. The first word he says that the word of God is useful for doctrine. It's useful for doctrine. Now, this word means that we learn the doctrine. We learn the word of God. Once we learn the word of God, the word of God is useful to reprove us or convict us. In other words, once you know that it's not good to steal and you steal, I'm able to come to you and convict you. You are guilty. The word says don't steal. You have chosen to steal. The next word is very important in this training process, and that's why I've asked Zach to come. Zach, here's what I'd like you to do. This word, correction, and I want to give you a visible display of the word correction. So if you could just turn around. You guys, give it up for Zach one more time. He's just such a great guy. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to put your hands out like this, okay? And I just want you to fall. Just fall. No, fall. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's embarrassing. Zach and I have been together seven years, okay? Uh, let's try it one more time. D I, no, backwards to me, dude. <laughs> All I want you to do is fall. That's it. Dude, just fall. I have like five more minutes. Okay, here we go. Yes. Okay. Now. Yeah. <laughs> You guys actually should be clapping. He is extremely heavy. <laughs> I want to show you the word correct. Watch it carefully. Zach has fallen. I have caught him. And now I'll correct his position. That is correct. Thanks. Here's the thing. Are you clapping for Zach or for me? I'm not too sure. <laughs> Zach. We came here today, right? And Jonan, you know, love her. Um, last week I came and Jonan, I haven't seen you in like six months. Hey, Chet, how are you? I come today with Zach, okay? Hey, Jonan, I've got a surprise for you. Zach comes around, she, and she goes, oh, hey, Chet. Zach comes around the corner. She goes, Zach, ah! I'm like, Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed his ten thousands. <laughs> the next word is training in righteousness. You see, once I've caught Zach and I lifted him up and corrected his position, I've realized Zach has a weakness. And whenever you have a weakness in a sport, you train. And you do those starts over and over and over and over and over again. Because the person of God is not perfect. The person of God is purposing to make weak areas stronger. The person of God is not perfect. The person of God is trying to make weak areas stronger. Next is a person of action. Would you take a look once again at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11? But you, O man of God, flee these things. A person of action. Now, Joseph sets the stage for the terminology that Paul's using. If you remember, Joseph fled from Potiphar's wife. And Potiphar's wife grabbed his little garment and said, hey, lay with me. And Joseph said, I'm out of here. And he started to flee. He ran and set an example for us to follow. Because can I tell you something, church? Potiphar's wife is still crying out to every one of us. She's still ripping at our gar garments. She is doing everything she can to tempt us to sin. So we've got to be people of action. 
We've got to take evasive action. We've got to counteract these daily temptations. And like I said earlier, not just run, but keep running, keep fleeing, because the enemy will not come at you one time. He will continually come at you one time because he has a goal to destroy you. There will be no relief from this life of temptation because it's a reminder that this world is not our home. He will come at us. Remember what the Bible says. After he finished the temptation of Jesus, he left him looking for another suitable time. The enemy is always looking for another suitable time to get you. So you got some decisions to make. Because God says he will always provide a way out. So it's your decision as to whether or not which road you are going to take. Now the problem with the road of temptation is this. We're actually enticed by it. It, it, It's sensual. It touches our senses. And because we're enticed by it, we're not afraid of it. Now remember when I told you the story about the rebels running down the road and I turned around and ran the other way? You know why? I was afraid of it. I was terrified for my life. So I took off because I was afraid. And we're not afraid of temptation. When it calls us, we go, here. When the chocolate cake says, eat me, I'll just take a bite. We're not afraid of temptation. And we have forgotten that temptation's goal is to kill, steal, and destroy our lives. Peter tells us that our enemy is out there like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's lying to you with the chocolate cake. He's deceiving you with the chocolate. And he tells you with this lie, you're the only one in the world that this will not impact. You can get away with it. Go ahead. Move forward with this decision. You're the only one in the world. So Paul says, flee your evil thing. Flee your evil thing. Paul doesn't leave us there. Finally, he says this. You got to be a person of pursuit. He says, don't just flee, but pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. You see, as hard as we are running away from one thing is just as fast as we are running to something else. As, far as, as hard as we are running from one place is as fast as we are running to somewhere else. Some of us, we run like this. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm coming. <laughs> Some of us run like this. I'm coming. I'm going to do it one more time. I'm coming. Some of us run like this. (laughs) Right? And some of us walk like this. Steadily getting brighter and brighter until the full day sun. Oh, sometimes we trip and fall. And then we get up again because though a righteous man falls, he gets back up again. You see, we have a goal. And whenever you see the goal in a race, whenever you see the finish line, let me tell you what happens. So I told you about this triathlon that Zach and I were doing. I hate to run. So at the end of the uh, the triathlon is the run. And I'm thinking, oh God, I'm going to die. Zach. Dun, 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 dun. And he decided in his wonderful pity for me that he was going to stay with me during the run. But he was like a horse that was leashed. So at the end of the race, when we saw the goal, I said, you can go. You know what he did? Like a horse out of a stall, I don't know what happened. Like lightning from the sky, 
He left me, and before I know it, he was 100 yards, and I'm running as fast as I can in my 46-year-old body. And he was gone. You know why? Because there was the finish line. And whenever you see the finish line in a race, you pick it up. You give it everything you've got. The Bible is giving us the finish line. And the finish line is this. Seven things that he tells us to pursue, and i got two minutes to get this done. <laughs> Righteousness. He says, I want you to pursue the known standard of God. It's revealed in his word. He says, I want you to pursue godliness. In this Greek word, it means I want you to be devoted to God alone. So your walk doesn't look like this. Your walk looks like this. He says, I want you to pursue faith. This word, it means the conviction of doctrine. In other words, I know it, I believe it, I live it, and I stand for it no matter what. Faith, love, it's unconditional. It doesn't change even for your enemy. He says, I want you to pursue patience. This is something that's steadfast. It doesn't change based on a circumstance. Paul says, watch, stand fast in the faith. Be brave, be strong. He says, be steadfast and immovable. He says, I want you to pursue gentleness. It's an inward peace. When Irma was heading towards Fort Lauderdale, I called my mom. And I said, are you leaving? My mom's from the Bahamas. Child, I ain't leaving this home. <laughs> and I said, Mom, you have to go. I'm a Bahamian. We've been through these storms before. <laughs> and I said, Mom, you have to go. She goes, it sounds like someone don't trust Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I love it when she throws Jesus into it. We call her the prophetess. She can look in your eyes and know your sin and tell you it in two seconds. She's staying with me for the next three weeks. Pray for me. I promise to be a holier person. But this word gentleness, it means this, an inward peace. No matter what comes my way, I got God. Nothing moves me. He says, I want you to pursue gentleness. And then he says this, final number seven, I want you to fight. Now this word fight, it's our English word, agonize. I want you to agonize. I want you to persevere no matter what. I want you to give it every bit of effort you got as if your life depended on it, because it does. There's a goal of the enemy to kill, steal, and destroy you. Unfortunately, temptation entices you. He lies to us and makes us forget there's a rebel in the front of the road. Run away. But what you're running from, make sure you know what you're running to. We're running to God. Now, there is one thing that you can't run away from. Jonah tried. God said, I want you to go to Nineveh. Jonah said, no, I ain't going there. That'd be like going to New York City and tell them they're all going to hell. <laughs> so you want to go to Nineveh? You go. I'm going to Tarshish. So much so, Jonah decided that suicide was better than going to Nineveh. He told the sailors, throw me overboard. Jonah had no idea fish was going to swallow him. He wanted to die. But God in his mercy sent a fish. Is it quite possible that God in his mercy has sent a chet to you tonight? Because the fish ain't so great. But he'll do anything to get your attention. You can't run from him. You're only to run from sin. So Lord, I come before you, two minutes late, but thankful for their patience, and asking in Jesus' name, that your grace would abound. Asking, Lord, that you'd forgive us for running from you 
instead of running from sin. David made a foolish decision. And Paul tells us some good decisions to make. Run from evil things and pursue Jesus. And help us to give it everything we've got. In Jesus' name. Amen.